one connection between these two cities. Uh, his name is Mike Fisher. <laughs> right? Mike Fisher, of the, uh, who just retired as the captain of the Nashville uh, Predator, Predators, and he played for the uh, Senators for quite a while, right? So um, thank you for that warm introduction. It's my first time being here. I've been to Montreal for conferences and to Toronto, but this is my first time to the uh, capital of Canada. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about these two words, quest and pursuit. As, um, as it was introduced, I didn't grow up, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but I was nurtured in an atheist home, and my two and a half years at Yale with a couple of religious studies classes basically convinced me that religion is basically panacea or opioid for the masses, and it can't be true, and so on and so forth. So, and I'll unpack that a lot more tomorrow. But I want to start with acknowledging the fact that I have questions, I have doubts. But these doubts that I do have are not defeaters for me to walk away from the truthfulness and truth of the Christian religion or the relationship that God has initiated with many of us here in this room. But so I want to acknowledge the fact that the way that I approach this topic may be slightly different, although maybe that itself will exemplify the diversity of perspectives within evangelical Christianity that we have. I thought it was really remarkable to hear from a, a Canadian and a French person, as well as someone who converted to Christianity from Islam. So there is already a kind of an emerging symphonic discourse about what it means to worship this living God. I want to start by asking this question, and there's a book along, these, uh, along this title, Good Without God. Is it possible to be without God? Many of us who are um, not believers might say, of course it is possible. Some of us who are Christians might also say the same thing. I want us to think about that a little bit today, good without God, with a question mark. Um, Greg Epstein, who is the secular uh, chaplain at Harvard University, has written that book, Good Without God, arguing that it is entirely possible to be good without God. I realize that some people may be sitting there saying, no, it is not possible because, as Jesus said, only God alone is good, and so on and so forth. So we'll try to unpack that a little bit. If not tonight, then certainly carrying on into my second talk tomorrow afternoon. Good without God and flipping it on his head, bad with God. Why are you bad even if you're with God? And I want to kind of present to you some of the hurdles for many in terms of their refusal to acknowledge the credibility of Christianity it has far less to do, in my humble opinion, with the person of Jesus or the work of Jesus or even with the New Testament texts themselves, but far more to do with the kind of uh, problem of lack of discipleship that we see. So I want us, especially if you're a Christian, I want us to be honest with God and honest to God. Because I want to underscore this very important fact that just because you're not able to answer a question about God does not, does not disprove the existence of God. I don't know about you, but I became a Christian in 1988, so it's not, it's been, what is it, about almost 30, 29 years. And I came to realize that the proof is not I don't have to try to be omniscient or semi-omniscient. I don't have to be all-knowing. And in my journey in some of the schools that were mentioned, I came to realize that I know a thing or two, but there, there are about 50 gazillion things that I do not know. And it's okay. And oftentimes Christians and non-Christians in their apologetic engagement tend to set up straw men and they beat it to a pulp and declare victory. And I don't want to do that here with you tonight. As George mentioned, these spiritual but not religious 
They're often called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. So N-O-N-E-S. They make up about 23% of the U.S. population, and I suspect the percentage point may be higher here in Canada, though I couldn't be so certain of it myself. Spiritual but not religious. So there are multiple ways of engaging this particular demographic, and um, I was, Nashville actually is, I don't know if you know, but it's uh, allegedly the buckle of the Bible belt, but also at the same time, because of the kind of veneer or thick layer of civic religion or kind of civil Christianity, there have been a lot of people who have become more jaundiced or disillusioned with that particular Southern American Christianity and then declaring themselves to be nuns. Three things emerge as I talk with them and in my kind of conversations with them. Uh, three words that begin with I, irrelevance, irresponsibility, and immorality. Irrelevance. Uh, why does it matter that Jesus rose again from the dead? So what? Does that necessarily preclude a possibility of me delving into yoga and Hinduistic practices and reading some Buddhist literatures? So the irrelevance of the Christian particularity. And secondly, irresponsibility. While the world is dying, some Christians, as many would say, are busy building their churches and doing this and that other project, and they basically create themselves a holy huddle, and that's what they seem to be busy themselves all the time. Irrelevance, irresponsibility, and also immorality. It could be the, perpet uh, the perpetration of abuse by pastors and priests upon the most vulnerable of our human civilization, human population. And because of the immoral practices of some of the Christians, many have become nuns. And so I was giving a talk about a month ago at Harvard Divinity School. They, uh, as some of you may remember, uh, Monday this week was the, f uh, Tuesday this week was the 500th anniversary of the nailing or mailing of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther. Scholars are pretty sure that he didn't nail them, but we do know for sure that he mailed them because it really kind of unleashed this revolutionary potential to clean up or reform certain aspects of late medieval Christianity and get the ball rolling in terms of this thing called early modern or modern world that we know it. So the talk that I gave at Harvard was entitled Reformation and Racial Taxonomies. I won't go into the details at all because I know I'll, I'm sure I'll lose a lot of you. But let me just share with you the gist of my talk. The gist of my talk was this, that some of the biggest promoters of social just, justice in the world, in the early modern world, were Christians. Some of the biggest promoters of social justice were Christians. And at the same time, some of the biggest preventers of shalom and social justice were Christians. And I think oftentimes I find myself kind of uh, seeing that some people, if you're kind of radical left or non-Christian, you tend to really gloat over the errors and moral, uh, moral and ethical lapses of the Christian community. And if you're more center-right and right-wing, then you tend to be busying yourself with covering up some other things and say, you know, if you actually understand it better, you're not going to say something like that. And so I, as a historian who's been trained in early modern English history or Reformation and post-Reformation England, so King James Bible and the Puritans, and particularly the whole controversies around the Trinity after the Reformation, have been some of the academic or intellectual and professional pursuits, research questions that I have. But along with all of that is a question of unbelief that became really unleashed with the Enlightenment. And so that's kind of my, what I think about and write about every day. And there's a sort of a professional hazard that are related to that. But the question once again is how to go on a religious quest. And I want to kind of step back and readdress this issue by saying why is it that some or many have decided to jettison the credibility structure of Christianity in terms of the orthodox version thereof? You know, I think the word quest is very important when I want to share this. I say that quest, uh, if you don't do it rightly, it'll end up in conquest. That if you're trying to kind of learn something, but you don't take the time to really develop the relationship with somebody else, that you basically pick and choose whatever you like, 
So if the quest does not lead to communion, it also easily lead to conquest. I want you to think about this. I want you to just kind of imagine, uh, you know, the Hubble telescope or Carl Sagan or Nova or think about, think of the, 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 the vast canopy of stars or galaxies. Think about that in your heart right now. Imagine. Think about the immensity of the universe and the seeming infinity of cosmos. Think about that. Just imagine right now, think of the stars, think of the, the galaxies, the millions and billions of galaxies that are in this universe. Think about the immensity or, you know, alleged infinity. It's not inf infinite, but think about the immensity of the universe. And think about what this Hebrew poet says in Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You see, there have been tens of thousands of different religious pursuits. Human beings have been in this business of creating, you know, kind of religions and creating gods in their own image, perhaps. And that's true, and that's one way that Calvin has tried to explain the whole uh, nature of idol factory that our hearts are. But think about the fact that there is a, such an immense universe that is out there, and there is somebody out there, and that somebody is out there desiring that we draw closer to that somebody. So the question becomes, what are you looking for? What are we looking for today? Have we found it? How do we really know? I think it is vitally crucial for us to raise those questions, even if you're a Christian and you feel like I found the answer. Even if it becomes a mere intellectual exercise, but I do believe that as you delve into these questions, I think especially if you're a Christian, you will walk away from this conference with a profound heart of gratitude that God, who is the artificer of all of these galaxies upon galaxies, God who is beyond all, beyond time and above time and in time, that this God has busied himself in creating this world and calling me to himself and giving me an identity, giving me the potential, giving me the desire to draw to God as God has taken the first step to draw near to us. Some of you may be familiar with the name Augustine of Hippo, a 4th century North African Christian. He begins his confessions with these words, and I want us to dwell on this a little bit. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. You have made us for yourself, O oh God, so our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. One of the reasons why Augustine's confessions had been read as an, a very integral part of Western Civ kind of courses in many universities uh, in Europe and, and North America is because Augustine stands as a sort of the prototypical figure of somebody who is in this project of quest. He's looking for something. He's in search of something. He's en route to finding something, and that something becomes himself. And there's a very interesting kind of logic that is at work here. The one is that there is a relationality established. You have made us. There is this kind of, he acknowledged that there is a creator. As, he, as we look around, we can either conclude that we are products of time plus chance plus matter, and that's entirely possible, warrantable conclusion for some people, or for others, they arrive at this conclusion that, you know, if when I think about this immensity of this universe, I come to realize the absolute insignificance of who I am and what I am, therefore my sense of wonder is evoked and enhanced. As the psalmist said, you know, who am I that you care for me? So Augustine says, you know, you have made us for yourself, that you are my creator. But also there is an honest about the human condition. Our hearts are restless. You know what? 
part of the, you know, because we are restless, we write music, we write songs, we write poetry, we write stories, we get, we, we drink and we have sex and we take drugs, cannabis or whatever, and we busy ourselves because in some ways we're trying to forget about Godot. We're trying to forget about, you know, that God figure. We think that by avoiding God, we'll be okay. But as Augustine says, you know what? Our hearts are going to be restless. There is going to be the restlessness that we're going to wrestle with throughout our life until they find their rest in you. So the third point that Augustine shows here is very clearly resting in God as the pathway toward that, uh, that, that finding yourself. That in this religious quest, the religious quest is basically in search of identity. Let me say it again. People's religious quest is basically you're trying to find yourself. You find gods or goddesses or, you know, God, and in doing so, what you're doing is you also find who you are. In relation to that particular deity, you're coming to this conclusion, aha, that's who I am. So what is this, again, back to Augustine? There is a creator, and the creator has created us in such a way that we're going to have this kind of uneasiness, something that we're kind of recognizing as this is not all there is to be. There, there, this is not all, that's, I'm crack, all that I'm cracked up to be, that there's got to be more, there's got to be more. And Augustine says, you know, when I find my rest in you, and he will talk about this later on in his confessions. Two things will happen. I'll find my rest, but at the same time, this wonderful God who is deeply satisfied in me as he is in the sun, he will create within me greater thirst, greater hunger, greater yearning. So then this yearning becomes not one of restlessness, but one of rejoicing. This hunger and thirst becomes not life um, not death-giving, not taking away of life, but is life-giving, and also it really provides us with that true identity and joy. So as we will talk about tomorrow again, you know, for me, as I, my own research field is not New Testament studies, it's not uh, comparative religions, it is early modern European intellectual history, meaning that how did this whole, like, kind of this uh, cultural plausibility structure of religions other than Christianity gain further and further foothold and ascendancy. And because of my own story, as we'll be, t we'll be talking tomorrow, I have talked a lot about and wrestled with these whole issues of epistemic and ethical defeaters, potential epistemic and ethical defeaters to the Christian faith, meaning this, that there are what I would call six factors that play a role in terms of people wanting to take their spiritual quest away from the traditional route of Christianity and walking away the increasing number of nuns. Why is it? Yes, we have talked about it as irrelevance and irresponsibility and immorality, but to be more specific, I want to share six things with you, and then we will um, actually, I'm actually quite surprised. I've only spoken for 17 minutes. I always go over time, so I kind of rushed it, and I'm going to be done pretty quickly, so I guess that'll be very, very good for many of you here, right? Like, yeah, this is great. You go to a conference, and you get done earlier than scheduled, and you're, I guess we have a little more time for Q&A, but six are as follows. Biblical, historical, and textual, and transmissional issues. So, namely, and I think Dr. Um, Lacona will talk about it tomorrow, the whole biblical, textual, critical matters, Right? So is the Bible true? Is the Bible errant or inerrant or infallible? What does it mean? And I think these have kind of come up much more ferociously since the Enlightenment or the kind of a rise of kind of grammatical historical exegesis, ironically. So it's this very interesting question of text critical issues that many have said, okay, look at the Bible. If you actually just study these texts and different kind of uh, aberrations between manuscripts, you cannot really believe this to be the case. And I'm sure we'll be really enlightened tomorrow from uh, Dr. Lacona's talk. Now, the second uh, potential epistemic and ethical defeater is this, science versus religion, right? 
So next week at Vanderbilt, there is going to be a Veritas Forum, uh, which is uh, one of the ministries of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And uh, we're having an MIT professor who is uh, um, one of the leading uh, professors in his own field. I think he does uh, biochemistry. And then there is a dear friend of mine who is uh, Vanderbilt. So MIT Christian and Vanderbilt agnostic, talk, and both scientists. Uh, and my friend at Vanderbilt is an astrophysicist. And um, they're going to talk about the whole issue of science and Christianity. And so if you think about this whole matter, I mean, for many people, science has become a new religion, scientism, right? And science, in science we trust. Science will be able to provide all the solutions, or most of the solutions that we're looking for for human woes and problems. And because of the sort of a, you know, scopes trial and the whole evolutionary paradigms and perspectives of looking at this universe and the, the earth doesn't seem that young anymore, as a result, I think many have concluded, I would say erroneously, that there is an incompatibility kind of, uh, or the impossibility of coexistence between science and Christianity. So, um, and I think that has a lot to do with this kind of scientific revolution and the church's role in hindering or helping the progress of science. The third potential epistemic and ethical defeater is the question of theodicy, meaning the whole problem of evil and providence. So at our church in Nashville, at Christ Presbyterian Church, I have the privilege of being their scholar in residence. And what that means, among others, is I preach about six, seven times a year, and every Sunday, well, about 30 Sundays out of the year, I teach Sunday school. And a couple of Sundays ago, I looked around, and there were about 60 or so people in the classroom, and I realized that there are two parents, two sets of parents, who had to say goodbye to their kids with zero preparation that a middle school student as well as a college student just died on them. The question of the Odyssey. It's not just, you know, the Lisbon earthquake in mid-18th century that prompted uh, Voltaire to write this poem, Candide, raising the question about the credibility of Christian deity. But in our stories, in our lives, we have stories upon stories of Asking that question, how long, O oh Lord, how long? So I've been at Vanderbilt for 12 years, and one of my greatest delights of being at Vanderbilt is the opportunity that I have to teach at this uh, maximum security prison in Riverbend, which is about 20 minutes from Nashville. And uh, one of the courses that I've taught there a couple of times is this The Odyssey class. And you know, the poignancy of talking about the problem of evil in this maximum security prison and wrestling with the issues of human entrapment. And most of the uh, inmates, or the insiders as they are called, most of my brothers are cognizant of the fact that it, you can't simply blame God. There is a human responsibility and human kind of owning up of some of our, you know, many of our issues, both individually and institutionally individually as well as structurally and systematically. But the question of theodicy has been one of those kind of perennial topics, but has become much more intensified as we have the new atheists and other scholars that have talked about these matters more recently. Fourthly, it is what I would call Christians behaving badly. So there was an American TV show, a sitcom called Men Behaving Badly, and I would say that it is the Christians behaving badly or lapse discipleship that has become one of the defeaters. Again, you know, I think this is one of the major issues that we have to take very seriously in our kind of pursuit of religious quest or pursuit of God. So a number of years ago, I think it was in 1997, 1996, um, I had the opportunity to work with some of the students uh, with crew, uh, it used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, down in, uh, in New York City at Columbia University. And so I would go up there from uh, Princeton to New York every Wednesday and kind of talk about um, cultural apologetics. Uh, I think I used 
We used R.C. Sproul's Reason to Believe, I think. And so we studied it for a semester. And then they said, okay, now that as the sort of climax event, what we are going to do is, I don't know if you've been to Columbia University, there's a beautiful library, and then there are these steps, and then there's a little plaza area. And it's like a, really there's a heavy foot traffic there. Students ride their bicycles or ride their you know, skateboards or walk. And so they said, okay, we wanna, we're going to put like a, a whiteboard, a blackboard, right in the middle of that walk pathway and we're going to write questions does god exist or if god exists why there are so many problems of evil and suffering and then what we want you to do is we want you to stand there from 9 a.m till 1 p.m for four hours and they will ask questions any question they will ask you should answer i <laughs> said and I wanted to tell them, look, I far prefer just prepared talks, right? Because I can prepare my talk and speak for about 40 minutes or 30 minutes in this case, and then I'll be done. And, and uh, there will be some Q&A, but, you know, it's far easier than just standing in the middle of the, you know, basically plaza, and anyone can walk up and ask questions. So, among other questions, it was about the uh, sort of credibility of Christian scriptures versus the Quran and, you know, a whole host of other factors. And I did my valiant best to try to, you know, bumblingly kind of try to answer some of those questions. And so by about noon, there was quite a lot of kind of students and other people just looking on and asking questions and engaging in a conversation. And I was like... You know, initially I was praying at 9 o'clock. I was like, Lord, please don't let anyone come this way. But then God didn't answer that prayer. God sent quite a few people and asked questions. And, but I think I, I grossly underestimated the work that God could do through human frailty. And I was doing okay, just okay. And I was looking at my watch and it's like, okay, I just have to go, go for another 40 minutes and I can go home. What a terrible attitude to have. But, you know, that's... That was, <laughs> So toward the end of my last half hour of my being there, standing there, nerve, you know, nerve-wrackingly, there was a student, and there was somebody who asked this question. He said, you know what? If you, if you say that Jesus is, you know, the Lord of all, and if Christianity is true and wonderful and whatever, how do you um, account for all the atrocities that you guys have committed in the name of God? And in particular, the Holocaust and said okay um, can I ask you a question he said sure I said um, what can I ask what ethnic background um, you come from and he says does it matter I said I don't know but it might matter and he said I'm a Jew and I said you know what before I try to answer you know anything at all can I tell you, can I offer you my personal apology for the things that my brothers and my sisters might have done in the name of Christ? And then this is what he said. He said, I'm not talking about Chinese people. <laughs> I said, I understand that you're not talking about Chinese people. I'm actually talking about, and I said, you know, there's something called the blood of Jesus being thicker than the blood of my parents, that in my travels to Ethiopia or Sri Lanka or India or Poland or England or wherever, Vietnam, I can look at somebody with a brown skin or yellow skin or white skin and say, you know, you're my brother, you're my sister. I think one of the most subversive and revolutionary teachings about early Christianity was that it really cut across the social, economic, and ethnic boundaries. So when I apologize, um, this is before uh, John Paul II, Pope John Paul II's official apology, you know, to the Jews, and I didn't realize it, but it, there, there, there it was. And after one o'clock came, everyone started to go home, and he kind of stuck around. And so I asked him, you know, uh, what brought you to this place? And he was actually a law student at Columbia University. So, and then he said, you know, I've gone to a lot of these Bible studies, and he was always trying to kind of get Christians to talk about this. And I asked him, so did, did my answer satisfy you? Uh, did my, you know, answer by way of apology satisfy you? And this is what he said. There's something that I'll never forget. And this is before I went off to do my... Uh, graduate studies in England. And that really kind of resonated with me deeply. 
He said, you didn't really answer the question of my mind, but you really answer in a way the question of my heart. Right? And that's when I came to realize, you know what? Human beings are not merely intellectual kind of downloadable machines. That in my journey, because, you know, God had it very strangely in terms of God's providence. My wife and I, when we were finishing up our studies in England, we were planning to go to uh, India to be missionary uh, profs there in Pune. But God somehow closed that door. And so, unbeknownst to me, God had a plan for me to go to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts. So from 2001 to 2006, unplannedly, we went to Boston, lived there for five years, and then unplannedly, God opened this door to teach at Vanderbilt University, and I went there. I remember telling my friends, I'm going as an academic missionary. So I think in the Divinity School where I have my primary appointment, I'm the only out evangelical, someone who's open and evangelical. And I have, you know, but it's been a very, very interesting journey that I came to realize in my attempt to understand the mind of God and mind of humans in, in terms of history and, you know, religious history, history of Christian thought and intellectual history, I came to realize that, yes, there are these intellectual questions that must be answered to the best of our ability, but at the same time, there is these things called the, the, the hurts and the wounds and the rejections and the kind of heart hurt, the wound of the heart. And for this particular brother, Jewish brother, when I said, I am sorry, and please accept my apology for and forgiveness, and I said, would you forgive me for the sins of my brothers and sisters? And I think, you know, in, in a way that I haven't forgotten about that one particular episode, for me, that was the highlight of my time spent with the students at Columbia. It wasn't so much about teaching apologetics, although that was helpful, but that brief engagement where this person said, you didn't answer the question of my mind, but you'd answer the question of my heart in ways that I did not expect. Fifthly, fifth potential epistemic and ethical defeater is the question of Christian uniqueness. Is Christianity truly unique? In what ways is it unique? Is Christian scripture truly unique? In what, in what ways is it truly unique? These are, I think, the questions that we will not answer to everyone's satisfaction during this conference. If this whets your intellectual and theological appetite into a greater quest of this God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the triune God who has revealed himself before creation ever came to be and who will be throughout eternity, that this, this question of Christian uniqueness, I hope will be one of those things that you will continue to wrestle with. But it's not just mere kind of jabbing your, you know, throwing punches in midair without any aim. The last point is about the person of Jesus, which is not a particular defeater as much as the answer or potential solution. For me, without sounding too reductionistic, it really, for me, the quest for meaning and joy and happiness, as I'll share more tomorrow, really came down to this person of Jesus, before whom I didn't have to try to pretend to be someone I really wasn't anymore. That leads me to this story in the Gospel of John. In the first chapter, there's a story of Philip and Nathaniel, and it's one of my favorite stories in all of the New Testament. Philip says, come and see, because Philip finds his friend's Na friend Nathaniel, and he says, we found the one about whom Moses had written. And then, you know, do you remember Nathaniel's retort? Nathaniel basically says, you know what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It would be tantamount to saying something like, I don't know, can anything good come out of, you fill in the blank as the most podong city or province in Canada or the United States of America? You know, it's, uh, can anything good come out of Biloxi, Mississippi? Well, Elvis came out of Biloxi, Mississippi, so it's not that bad, but you get what I'm saying. So can, and so this question of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then Jesus looks at Nathaniel, and this is what he said. Here truly is an Israelite in whom no deceit dwells. And then Nathaniel asked Jesus, how do you know me? And then Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. You know, for me, the, the beauty is when, what, what Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see. 
It's an invitation. Philip says, you know what? I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I think I found the one. I think I found one. So your job, yes, study the, you know, the, 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 um, you know, about the resurrection, about history of Christian theology, history of Christianity, contemporary ideologies, and all of that. But in the end, in the end, I always come down to this. You know, coming, I was sharing with, with a brother here earlier tonight that, you know what, I far prefer preaching. Because when I preach, it is the power of the gospel, is the power of God to save. The burden is not up to me. It is up to God to do it. And I was very much involved in apologetics before, and I'm really excited to be, kind of, there's a sort of sense of rejuvenation within me to be involved in this again, but with a much more kind of uh, chastened epistemic confidence, okay? Meaning that I believe that God is going to do God's work, and it is entirely up to God, and it's none of my kind of frailty. I just have to do the very best I can and leave everything entirely up to God, and all I need to say is, come and see and meet Jesus because he will answer the questions of your heart and head in ways that nothing else can. So I want to leave you with these words from Jeremiah 29. In that Hebrew Bible text, in that kind of exilic community that that they're now experiencing exile. Okay, scholars can debate about whether it was written like way later or way, that's not the point. And I always share this with my critical scholar colleagues. Like, look, okay, when Jeremiah was, was, was written to me is in some ways absolutely irrelevant. We have, I'm sort of a canon critic. We have to deal with the fact that it is there. It is in the Bible, and we have to wrestle with it. It says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plan I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. You see, friends, this is it. To this exilic community, to the people who are desolate, who have been defeated, whose national security had been robbed of them, whose national pride had been now, you know, completely evaporated, to these losers of history, God comes and says, you know what? I got a plan for you. I got a plan not to harm you, but to give you hope. I got a plan to prosper you, and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. God is guaranteeing God's, pro- God's presence. God is guaranteeing that God's perennial hope for the people of God. You see, dearly beloved, that's what this is all about. As you're seeking God, and I hope that you will seek God with this confidence, what Leslie Newbegin will call proper confidence. Proper confidence in the gospel. Proper confidence in the persons of the triune God. God who spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. God who spoke through the evangelist John. God who speaks through you and me. Let's continue to draw our strength and our hope in this God and God alone. Because God says, you know what? As you're in this quest to find yourself in me, have this joy in knowing that I have already found you. And even the, the very fact that you're moving toward me, that would be impossible had I not already drawn myself closer to you. May you find this God to be worthy of your life's greatest joy and greatest challenge. Thank you very much.